as I follow her on social media, I'm super inspired by how she's been able to juggle her own personal life and the brands that she works for. So, so hopefully she'll be sharing a lot more insights tonight about how she manages to do that. I'm not going to waste any time. She is super nervous to be up on stage, so I need you guys to give her a huge round of applause. Please put your hands together for Lisedi Mashal. Hi guys, thank you so much for having me. I'm quite surprised by the crowd and the size of this room. That's probably why Lloyd is saying I'm nervous. I just want to clarify something that Lloyd touched on. I'm not a gig guide, which is the nickname some people tend to give me because of my job. But yeah, thanks for that, Lloyd. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you to everyone for coming out. I understand that it is freezing cold. But for me, the opportunity to always just to connect with people, one in the industry and to learn from others is one that I would never miss. So I'm really honored that you guys chose to come today. I thought the best way to approach this talk is a combination of my career, the lessons I've learned and how I got here today. And then I was going to just jump into a couple of questions that I'd already seen come up online. So I started my career at Unilever. So I remember applying in my third year when I was still at Bits University. And I was quite intentional about applying to Unilever, Nestle and Procter & Gamble. With the marketers that I'd been exposed to at the time, I was very clear that from a foundation phase and the best place to learn has to be one of those three, even if it means moving down to Durban. So I applied for the graduate program that would then kick off in my next year. I went there, I was shortlisted for the assessments. I went in with a lot of energy, I was very intentional, I was a little bit intense from a leadership point of view. My view was take charge, make sure that they can see that what you're talking about is the most important or you've got like a massive contribution. So I thought I did well. We sat with the marketing team, it was the directors, it was the brand managers, it was also I think a supply chain director that was then doing the assessments and it, was, it ran the whole day. The idea there is that once you got assessed, you then get feedback about a month or so after, you find out if you've made it, and then you get permanent employment at Unilever. With my big ego, great results from third year, I thought, I'm in, there's no reason why Unilever turned me down, but they did. I got a phone call um, a month later, and the feedback they gave me was like, they said, well, your energy and your marks are great. Your ability to work in a team is questionable. You come in with a lot of intensity. You don't seem to understand what it is to lead from the back. And it, you don't seem to have a perception of understanding the role other people's inputs play in an outcome. So I'm what, 21, 22, what? What does this even mean? So I had a very bruised ego, but instead of giving up, I was like, okay, I haven't heard back from Procter & Gamble. I haven't heard back from Nestle, and I'm very clear these are the three I wanna work for, so let me do my honors and try again. So I tried again in my honors year and I applied, same process, got shortlisted. Luckily for me, it was a different set of directors that did the assessments and we had another group as well. And I made it. But I remember being quite intentional about the fact that, you know, some of the feedback I didn't necessarily understand. It's not like at university, there's a lot of group work you have to rely on yourself. But the biggest lesson for me that I learned there that when it comes to any outcome, whether it's your individual success or even an organization or a brand, your voice alone is not enough. You are a system of people, network or everything that surrounds you. And that's how you should be focused when in, terms to, in terms of how you show up and it comes to leadership as well as what your brand is. So that was the first lesson for me. Then, because I'm young, I'm naive, I made another mistake. I think it was probably my second day at Unilever. So when we joined, they never told you beforehand what brands you would be um, given or what projects you'd be working on. The city, weave, makeup, beautiful outfit. They put me on Norox. <laughs> my first brand was Norox, Soya Mints, Stock Cubes, and the soups. So I was very confused. I'm like, brand it doesn't look like me it doesn't feel like me what value can I bring and I was a bit bratty about it if I'm honest because I wanted to work on ponds I wanted to work on X these are the brands that I was exposed to these are the brands that look like they're doing really really cool things and now I have stock cubes 
So a director had heard, and I think someone whispered to him that were, I was a little bit disgruntled and I didn't understand. And I think for me, I was quite lucky in the sense that he took grace upon me and chose to explain versus to judge the point of view that I had. So he pulled me aside and he was like, you know, Lissetti, because you're young, there's certain things that you probably don't understand. From a profit point of view, certain brands have a higher perception externally versus actually the revenue they bring into a business. At the time, Norox was the fourth profit contributor to Unilever, and Exxon Pons were 9 and 11. So from a ability of what was I going to be exposed to, the kind of budgets that I would work on, yes, the target audience is different, it's not me, but I would be able to create a TV ad, because those are the type of brands that create TV ads in South Africa. It's not the brands that have to follow a global direction because the budget is smaller. So again, oh, you said he. Another mistake, it's your first week in corporate, when are you gonna learn? But for me, the key take out there was, what you consider perception is not reality. I could have shot myself on the foot and asked to be removed on Norox, robbed myself of an opportunity to learn because what I thought I see every day, I thought was the most important and relevant, versus that's actually not the case. And then, because it's Durban, and again, I'll say it, I was young and a little bit, and, childish in my approach of the industry, I chose to leave. I was approached by S.A.B. Miller, and I worked on Hansa Pilsner in their comms team. So at the time, the marketing team was always split into comms, strategy, and then what they call through the line. So comms would be the ones that create TV ads, through the line are the guys that do the campaigns like Drake unlocks, I don't know, Castle Light unlocks Drake, and then you've got your strategy team that would put together, let's say, the 18-month calendar for the year of how the brand show ups, positioning, insights, etc. So I did comms, but while it was probably the best learning curve I have because I'm generally passionate about comms, I learned very quickly that I didn't have an understanding of the full value chain of marketing. I couldn't be two, three years in my career and I'm choosing to specialize because it then means I don't understand the impact of the other roles. So then after about 18 months, I had to start asking for projects that were strategy specific, and I had to start asking for projects that were through the line specific. And I think for me, if I'm being honest, it was a combination of not asking enough. I was excited about the appeal, it's SAB. Everybody wants to be there and they want me, so let me just go. Versus was I clear, have I spent enough time at Unilever, a place I tried to get into for two years, learned as much as I wanted to learn, versus running back to Johannesburg for money and you know what I mean, a big brand. So again, another lesson. If I'm honest, I didn't know to, and I was scared. I don't think a lot of people are bred in a society where it's okay to question, where it's okay to say, I don't understand, versus you're thrown in the deep end and you're expected to swim, versus people are saying, actually, you exist in an ecosystem that is built to help you win, tap into it. No one did that for me, and I also didn't know that there's people available to do that. I had to pay attention to my environment, and then I understood, actually, I should be leaning on others. And then I moved to, and this was two years later now, I moved as brand manager at GlaxoSmithKline. I was on Aquafresh. The biggest lesson I learned when it came to Aquafresh is that I probably should have trusted my gut. From the fourth day, I remember sobbing in the bathroom because I hated it that much. But I'm four days into the job now. I can't say... SAB, take me back, even though I said I'm leaving and I'm not happy. And this was a promotion, right? So in essence, I actually should have been happy versus should I have stretched my reach at SAB and ask for more work or ask to switch into the other streams versus chase a promotion and more money at Aquafresh. I mean, I'm not going to lie, I enjoyed the more money, but I suffered from a mental point of view. I lost a lot of my drive. I remember some of the feedback being given around me, the city's so stubborn. She doesn't want to show up when she walks into the office. She doesn't look interested or passionate about her work, which is very shocking. I mean, I was head girl, fantastic marks, and then all of a sudden, I'd never received such negative feedback. But for me, it's because I chose, I didn't choose Aquafresh because that's a brand I've always wanted to work for. It didn't suit my passion. It didn't suit who I am. So already from a fit point of view, there's a very big disconnect. But at this stage, I decided to add out, and I stuck it out. I stuck it out for 18 months. I then got promoted to Grandpa. And well, with Grandpa, it was then the paint portfolio. I was marketing manager on Grandpa and Culpo and a couple of other, and it was a pharmaceutical, so it's pain medicine. 
And I remember saying to myself, I'm not sure one, I would have made it to a marketing manager position so quickly if it was another organization, so that's a blessing. But from a learning point of view, I now have to expand my mind past toothpaste, aquafresh, or let me say one category, to three. Cowpool speaks to kids. Grandpa is the biggest painkiller in the country. I know Twitter has a view on why people should consume it or not, but the learning and opportunity it presents was quite large. Luckily for me, if I'm honest, it is quite a boring category, so I didn't have to stay, and I got the opportunity then to move to Diageo. But by the time I'd moved to Grandpa, this is when I then started my business. So I own a hair extensions company called Muriri Baliseri. So now this is 2014 when I started this business. By the time I'm on Grandpa, it's about 2015, towards 2016. I started the business, I would do it in the evenings. By the time I got home, you couldn't ask me anything grandpa related, Aquafresh related, I wasn't interested. I had clients to respond to, I had Instagram, and well, I would still Instagram moments at lunch, but that's a different topic. Respond to emails, see I can service clients. I was trying to learn as much as I could about an industry. And I remember, I think it was one of my sisters making a comment about, Lissidi, are you not tired? And my comment was, I can't afford to be. I'm clear that money is coming in because I stay in corporate, but I hate this job and I'm passionate about hair. It was from that that I'd met a photographer who would help me at the time I was doing my websites and he had said, Lissidi, maybe you should actually consider blogging as a manner of communicating your product. You know so much about the industry. Girls inbox you and you end up replying to people up until one o'clock in the morning versus if you created buckets of information that brought people into the industry to understand how a product is used, maybe that could be an additional selling point for you. So because I didn't understand the industry at the time, I fought with them for a year up until I finally agreed and I gave in. So again, while I'm still at GSK, I've now started the hair business. I've started blogging as well, reluctantly. I got into it, I loved it. By this time, 2016, I moved to Diageo. I was approached to join them on J&B and Primaries as a portfolio. And at the same time, I got a call from Unilever. They said, we're starting a new platform called All Things Hair in South Africa. And you're one of only two black girls in the country that does and speaks about hair. So from a, a voice and a viewpoint, we think you've got something to contribute to the conversation. Are you interested in talking to us about what this platform could look like? I was like, of course I am. What does this mean? What I'm talking on behalf of you. And they're like, no, we're building a platform. We're looking to collaborate with people in the industry that understand. And you've, seem, you've seemingly put in a lot of work into your process. We've analyzed your post, your frequency, how you approach your knowledge sharing. So we'd like to have a conversation with you. Long story short, we had the conversation and then I agreed to come on board as one of the um, ambassadors at the time for All Things Hair when it first launched in the country. So that was my first official influencing and blogging job and I was also still at corporate at the same time. And then if I now move into my career at Diageo, I mean, I worked on a brand like J&B. I was really passionate about it. Thankfully, I learned my lesson before moving. But I think for me, the change happened because when I was there at the time, I had a, we had a director, and I'm not gonna mention her name, who didn't understand why I had a side hustle. I remember she would even make comments like, is this not distracting from work? How can you be passionate about more than one thing? What are you giving of yourself at the office if you still got other things in the back of your mind? And three months before I left Diageo, a new lady joined. Her name is Zumi Jongwe, and she's my current boss. And she put me in the role that I'm in today. So my role is new in Diageo, South Africa. The only one in Africa and only three in Diageo globally. I'm head of PR, influencers, partnerships and events. But for me, this would have never happened if it wasn't a culmination of these lessons that I learned, right? One, it was listen to people who are in the industry and know more. Be open to feedback and criticism. Be clear about what makes you passionate and what will fuel you and make you wake up in the morning. And also just back yourself. I don't think people do that enough. People don't ask questions enough just like I do. I don't think people study industries that they're in enough. If I think of the influencer space, I get quite disappointed when I'm interacting with a lot of the guys because they're not even clear on why they're charging the rates they're charging. They're not clear on their engagements. If I think of even their personal brand, and again, it's the mistake I made when I was younger, you're walking around, you're not being intentional around who can hear me say what I'm saying, what I'm tweeting. While I understand people have personal opinions, you never know who's watching and listening. 
You know, I'll make an example of, I've seen a beautiful conference that's been happening over the past three days. The amount of negative feedback I've seen confused me. One, it was from people that are trying to get into the industry. I can tell you now, if someone's trying to get into the industry and I see that this is how they carry themselves online, I would never work with them. And personally for me, it's because this person is not clear that this is a job. I can't walk into the office and start yelling because I'm upset at a decision that the customer marketing team made or the finance team made versus I've got my mother for that. I've got my sister for that. I've got WhatsApp groups for that. There's no need for that to be a permanent voice that I put outside and people then don't understand how, what's my brand and how to perceive myself. If I'm an influencer, from the time I log on at six o'clock in the morning before I shower, I'm at work. And that's what people need to do. I think also from a, a research and understanding how an industry grows, a lot of people are falling into the influencer industry versus actually understanding its role. Print is dying if it's not dead already in so many countries and South Africa. That money is moving into digital. But it's not just moving because, oh, Lissetti has a channel. It's actually moving into digital publishing. That's what influencer channels are. So when you fall on it because you're a beautiful girl, you take 12 selfies and you get 5,000 likes, that's not enough. Bless you, you are gorgeous, but that's not enough. Print publishing started because someone had a view. Whether it was Vogue that, I don't know, they thought aesthetics should be presented in this way, couture needs to be preserved in this way, X, Y, Z, or it's House and Garden who photographs certain types of home. You have a narrative and you have a voice. Protect it and learn about it versus I'm a pretty girl, a, oh, a client sent me a product, I'm actually not going to tag them. No, it's not enough. Be intentional. And even for me, if you're starting out, you never know who's watching. There's a, a girl, and I forget her name now, the, was you liking her name? I forget her name, and yes. I don't think she woke up and said, I'm going to tweet this and it's going to make me trend. I mean, while it's painful to see for some of us, this girl has now, I think, 70,000 additional followers in one year from one tweet. You never know what you put out there, what's going to happen once it's come out of your mouth and it's sitting in a digital platform. So be intentional about how you show up. I know I'd even gone to, there was a stage, and to be honest, it was because I was scared of Twitter, where I didn't want to do anything wrong. I created a fake profile just so I can look at things and laugh and retweet, because there is some things you want to share and you want to engage in. And I was like, but Lizzie, you should still be who you are, just be intentional. If something's funny, it's funny. But also be clear on who you are, who's watching, and who could be watching. Who could go and look at your profile in three or four years' time? They should never be confused about, when I see her walk in the room, this is who she is. But when she talks online, this is how careless she is. There should never be a disconnect when it comes to building your brand and other brands, especially in the space of influencer marketing. An authentic brand for me would be a brand that's one consistent. It's honest in its narrative, it owns its mistake, it's clear in its tone and how it interacts with people, but also it doesn't change just because times are evolving versus it's clear on how it needs to represent itself within that time. So you should be able to encapsulate what my brand personality is, which is also not one-sided. So I can work with a multi-faceted set of people because it also is representative of who my brand is, but it needs to be authentic and we need to be able to speak to each other. Yeah. I wanted to call again on the point just around the changing age of influencer marketing. And I'm hoping there's a couple of, in yeah, there is, I won't call people out, there's a couple of influencers in the audience. I wanted to urge you guys, even those that are starting out, don't chase money. I promise you money will come. There are influencers here, if I think from an aesthetics point of view, these guys shoot stuff with their iPhone that blows my mind away. An iPhone, or even an, well, a Samsung, a Huawei, I think that's how it's pronounced, they shoot such beautiful content. You should be, should be going to the extent of, I need a ring light, I need a 50 mil lens, I don't know, Canon, etc. versus if you're genuinely passionate about something, frame it so that you're clear that this is how you want people to understand what you're talking about, but you as well. Those are how the most authentic audiences grow. If I, and it's, you probably see it in the best case with the beauty bloggers. Girls would be posting, showing how they do their eyebrows. And within a day, there's 2,000 followers. Because why? Girls are curious about how do I do my eyebrows. I mean, granted, as a trend now, it's a little bit outdated. And girls either want to know how to contour, strobe, and whatever. But that's why those girls built an, an organic following. 
I can tell you now, the guys I still worked with at Unilever who are working at Woolworths will call me. They say, did you know this person? Yeah, I've seen them online, what do you think? But you're the same person, I don't want to greet other people. I don't want to be clear about my narrative online. I don't want to speak to brand managers and make sure they know me as a personality. It's probably one of the biggest mistakes that people are making. Be authentic. That's what every organization is about. Make sure people know who you are and stand for it. Be consistent. Yeah, that's me, guys. For me, I don't wake up in the morning and I'm like, how do I walk into a room and I say, how do you listen to me? Because I feel like that comes across as very almost like you're dictating to people. I make a conscious effort and I reflect on how do I want to be perceived when I leave a room? Do I want people to understand that I was clear? Do I want them to know that I was intentional and I was passionate about the topic? For me, that means more. And as a result, how do I then make sure I am and I'm well versed to represent myself in that way? So the first thing that I want to ask you, right? Because <laughs> there's a couple of questions that are going to come from the floor as well. Okay. The thing that, I, that always mesmerizes me and you've kind of touched on it in terms of how you've been able to juggle between your, um, your nine to five career and the, the, the career that you're kind of paving on a social media space. Mm. There's a lot of mistakes that a lot of people make yeah. um, when they're trying to do that. And you, and you alluded to one of your um, superiors asking you the question, like, how are you holding this down and why are you doing it? Mm. How have you been able to strike that bal balance first and foremost? And if I'm someone who's trying to do that as well, what are like the two things would you say to me that like, you need to absolutely avoid? One, I would say balance is a very strong word, but I, if I think of my journey, the biggest lesson I've had to learn, and it's something that I still have to remind myself of daily, given what I do, not everything is going to win every day, yeah. and that should be okay. Got you. Right? Because no one is superwoman. We like to hear about it, but working yourself to the grave is not worth it, because yeah. you also still need to be able to live life. But what that also means is that you then need to be responsible to those that support you and to yourself. Yeah. If not everything is going to win, be clear about what is. And that's stakeholder management. Yeah. If you can't do X, Y, Z and it's not a priority, yeah. don't do it. But communicate it. If you don't, then other people aren't aware of, are you managing it? Do you want to do it? And where do you sit and what's the comfort level? Yeah. I'd also say... Do one thing at a time when you're building. Yeah. It's good and well to say, I have interests in five different buckets and this is what I can do. Until you've done one thing very well, don't cloud your view yeah. and your ability to contribute to it. Wait yeah. till it stabilizes and then introduce something else. Love that. Now, let me flip it quickly. So now you are paving this way in terms of your own personal brand and, and growing it. Mm -hmm. But you also sit on the other side, on yeah. client side, where you're getting... Proposal after proposal, influencer after influencer wanting to work on the brands that you work on. What are the, the things that make you want to definitely work with those people? So how do you go about choosing those people that you work with and the brands you work with? And how also, when we flip it, what turns you off when like, you're like, okay, I'm seeing this person. Yes, they have all the, they tick the boxes, but something about this doesn't work. And what are those things? I'll start with what ticks me off because it's, it's top of mind for me, especially the conversation I brought up that's been happening on Twitter. I don't think from an influencer or even a creative space enough, people understand how many people are fighting for them in rooms. Yeah. And those are the same people that whether you have a personal relationship or not, it's more important for you to drag online. Yeah. Why? Unnecessary. It's unnecessary. It clouds your brand. And for me, it makes you even unprofessional. It's like I've said, as soon as you come on to work with one of our brands, you then become a colleague or an agency partner. You're part of the family. Yeah. So should we ever have a disagreement? I don't expect that you're now going to be dragging me online. <laughs> People and their opinions. Yeah. Yeah. And if, <laughs> mind you, I have plenty of opinions. Yeah. And some of them are not great. Yeah. But why should they live on Twitter? So what works? Because th those would be some of the things that completely turn you off. But what works? What catches your attention? So what I do personally is I look at a lot of people. Yeah. 
I might not follow, but I'm looking. Yeah. And sometimes it's through a ghost profile. I still do that, especially for my job. But I, I like to understand people's personality almost on and off. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people are also aware of, they sometimes look different on their feed versus even their stories. Yeah. So I like to understand who is this person, especially I start probably six weeks before, no, not even six weeks, six months before contracting yeah. because I want to understand the personality. Yeah. I need to be able to say this person speaks like this, I don't know, if there's heated discussions, this is how they respond or this is how they show up at events, this is how they treat people, this is how they talk about topics and then I can easily say if this person was a brand, which brand would it be? Because yeah. this is how the brand talks, this is our brand personality, this yeah. is how we show up. So for me already it allows for synergies. Yeah. I also like to work with people that I think are authentic. Yeah. There's nothing worse than people that want to portray either access to a lifestyle or a topic and they have actually nothing to contribute about a conversation. People will say, I mean, there's people who will say they're makeup artists and then it's very clear that they don't even understand the chemical makeup of a product. Mm -hmm. For me, you're not an influencer if that's the case. Yeah. An influencer shouldn't be something that's taken lightly. Influencers 15 years ago were beauty editors and these ladies had to study product. So if you're an influencer, for me, you need to understand your industry. You could even be a photographer and be an influencer, and that's okay. But you understand your industry and you respect it. That, for me, is the person I want to work with. So from a marketing and a, a brand person's point of view, I would say we've got a responsibility to do better. I agree with you in the sense that I do think there's an element of Brand managers and marketing people are so intimidated by the space that they w either want to work with the same people or they're not doing enough to develop it, understand it, but also make sure that they're working with the right people. So there's that. And then there's two, because people say they're influencers, and, and I'll, I'll say from this regard, the guys that are mostly credible. If you are new to an industry or you're aware you're at the starting phase of an industry, it is your job to teach. It's your job as the influencer to teach me as the marketer what makes money for you and what works. It shouldn't be one-sided. So as soon as we're not teaching each other, this is where the flaws in the industry are happening. And sometimes teaching each other means, you know what, for a trade exchange, which is not monetary product, this is what I can do for your brand and this proves my case point for why I either should be earning this much or not. For me, that should be the premise of why trade exchanges are happening. Also, we also live in an environment where people need to be honest. Sometimes a drop is just a drop. And you should never feel inclined to post it unless it's a brand that you're associated with or you have a relationship with. I think the problem why people are hopping and hopping and hopping, not enough people are intentional. And I'll say, I say that because as Diageo, I'm very sensitive about some of the people that we work with and I make that very obvious. I can't work with you if I know next week you're running to Remy Martin, but then it means you're not genuinely interested in my products and the value they bring. Versus when I stand in a room with you, you must be clear, Diage, you're standing with you, supporting you. So if you're not using me, you can't then be upset and run somewhere else. So you also can't be the person, I want to drink this, 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 and this. So I disagree with saying influencers can't necessarily use too many products at the same time, because no one person is one product. We can start there, but from a, a, a family of brands, you should be consistent at the very least because no one drinks seven different brands. That's just ridiculous. Like, it, it doesn't happen. <laughs> but I can understand that, you know, sometimes once every three months, Lucidi might love a gin, or on other days, she's a vodka girl. That's fair. But I think that also happens because people quit or start this industry too soon without understanding what makes money. So until you've qualified, I don't know, that the Unilever organization as a business pays X millions to influencers, but this is Diageo's approach, this is how brand managers want to do it, or the industry is changing for them, and Instagram al algorithm, you shouldn't be in that industry and quitting and doing it full time, because you'll be joining from job to job to job versus actually contributing. I'm going to ask you one quick question, 30 seconds. Um, we got a question on... Uh, um, social media, Uzuki Sapio wanted to know what is the key thing that an aspiring social influencer needs to do at grassroots level in order to build a brand and to stay relevant? Introduce themselves. I think people would be pleasantly surprised by how many brand managers are interested in even just reading people's profiles. Yeah. They don't do enough of the work, they don't understand the industry for so someone to say, I want to seat at your table, I want to talk to you. Yeah. They'll say yes. So introduce yourself and start building a relationship with the brand. Yeah. It might not be commercial or financial at the beginning, yeah. but the brand is bringing you into the network. They could be introducing you to other influencers to help mentor you.
For me, living better means when I sleep at night, I'm at peace for the most part. I need to be clear that when I was in the office, even if it was in the biggest or in the smallest way, I had good impact on people and my energy was something people could draw from. I think there's nothing worse whether you're in a position of power or you're in a boardroom and people walk away drained and they didn't learn from you or they didn't get the opportunity to say, thank you for letting me in. So if I can sleep at peace knowing that I was able to provide that for someone, I'm happy.